Good morning, everybody. In the scripture reading this morning, did you catch the phrase, the use of fear always being said about God, or being said by God? Let's uh, read it again. In Exodus 20:20, 20, 20, it reads, And Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. And you know, when I first read that quickly, I thought to myself, what's up with that? Are we not to fear? Are we supposed to fear? And you know, when I was younger, I don't know if any of you ever remember this, but there used to be a lot of shirts with the logo, no fear, emblazoned across them in big, bold letters. But you know, when I was in college and studied psychology, the folks who had brain damage in the parts that controlled fear usually didn't live very long. They ended up walking into traffic, falling off roofs, or other type of incidents even a two-year-old had learned how to avoid. But the guys with the t-shirts were so proud to be sporting them and were claiming they didn't have fear. And in the Bible, we read several times, like in Job 28, 28. And to man, he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And apart from evil is understanding. And also in Proverbs 1, 7, Proverbs 1, 7, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Now, how does that work? Why would being afraid make me smarter? It just didn't make a lot of sense to me. And there's a lot of questions about fear right now in this world. We've got a lot to be afraid of. We share a fear of an invisible virus with the whole world during this pandemic. We fear those who are supposed to protect us. The leaders fear the people. People fear their leaders. We have violent outcomes from what starts out as peaceful protests. So that there's even fear of what happens if we speak up for a worthy cause. We have millions out of work and are afraid of not being able to feed their children or put a roof over their heads. Fear is everywhere right now. Whether we put on a tough guy facade and pretend we are immune or not, everyone is affected and everyone is experiencing fear. So let's talk about it. What is it? Is it bad? Is it good? How should we view it? A few weeks ago on Wednesday night, we talked about how beautiful God's word is. And when you take three passages of the scripture, you can actually see how amazing God's word is. So let's try the passages with the topic of fear. And for those that are not there that Wednesday night, the three passages are basically face value. What do we see from a simple inspection? Initial inspection, we poke our head in a little bit. What do we find when we dig just a little bit? And we, we call this plant a flower. And then on the deeper inspection, when we dig a whole lot and we dig deeper, we call this plant in the garden. So let's, let's try this with fear. So at face value, what do we know about the value of fear? What do we know about the face value of fear? We know that we aren't supposed to fear, but yet we are to fear God, but we are to love God. At face value, fear is not simple. There appear to be different aspects to it and different uses for it. In some, it seems bad in some instances and good and called for in others. Why are we not to fear, but we are to fear for God? Why is fear appropriate for some circumstances, but not for others? So let's dig a little bit deeper. Let's take a second pass. And let's start with what exactly are we supposed to fear? In the search of the Bible, the word fear is mentioned around 450 times and afraid around 212 times. Now that is a lot of occurrences. For some reference, the word life is mentioned around 455 times. God is mentioned more than 4,000 times, man around two to 3,000 times, and pray, or the word pray, around 340 times. So we know there's a, a lot of talk about fear and being afraid. So data-wise, fear seems to be a fairly common topic in the Bible. So let's visit a few of those instances and see what should we be afraid of. And you know, if you look right off the bat, we come to Genesis 3.10, when Adam and Eve fear being caught naked in the garden. And let's look at that. Genesis 3, 9 through 10. And it reads, Then the Lord God called to Adam and said, Where are you? And so Adam said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Now this is the first instance in the Bible we hear of fear. So let's dissect this a little bit. The scene is the Garden of Eden, beginning of time, or what we know of time. Adam and Eve have been strolling around buck naked for who knows how long, and they fall into temptation, 
eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And all of a sudden, they're afraid of God because they know that they walk around in the buff. It may not be the best idea in front of the Almighty God. They were, well, underdressed for the occasion. So who is afraid in this instance? Well, us humans, man is. What was feared? God. Why? Well, they were not prepared to be in the presence of the Almighty. And you know, I think Adam and Eve actually got this first instance of fear exactly right. The Bible really is beautiful. And if you look at this passage, Adam and Eve hit on the perfect example of when to experience fear. Of all the times when we read about the fear of God, which comes up a lot in the Bible, I believe this example from Adam and Eve is perfect. They feared not being ready to be in God's presence. They feared not being ready for the inspection by the king of the universe. And I believe that really, if we turn to Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14, this is what Solomon means when he says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. So when we are living our life, going about our day-to-day -day activities, one thing to keep in the back of our mind is, am I ready for God's inspection? Now, does this mean we're trembling and cowering and sitting there pretty much frozen to our seat and not moving at all? No. <laughs> if we have something in our, wrong in our life that we need to make right, yes, that could cause some trembling if we really understand the situation until we take steps to get back in the right. However, if we are washed in the blood, the Jesus, blood of Jesus that covers a multitude of unpleasantness, we are as close and as ready as we can because of Jesus. And this is where the following verses comes in. If you turn me to 1 John 4, 15 through 19. 1 John 4, 15 through 19. And in that it reads, Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we should have, may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. He who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Now think about that. Boldness in the day of judgment. That's a nice thought, right? There's no longer fear of being naked in front of God as long as we have the gift of salvation covering all of our sins. Even though we know good and evil, when we choose good, when we choose God, and God, God has a way for us to come back to the state we were in the garden and be back directly with him. That's a pretty nice gift. Okay, so now that we know that what we are to fear is God, and the fear of God is to take seriously the thought of being ready for God's presence, how does that make us smarter? That seems, still seems pretty odd to me. But that is what Solomon also says. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So let's dig a little deeper. Let's look at someone who faced a lot of fear. Let's go to King Hezekiah. To set the scene, this is coming from 2 Kings 18 and 19. And so there's, there's two whole chapters here. But for time's sake, we're not going to read both chapters. We'll just do summarizing. So in 2 Kings 18 and 19, basically the, the summary of King Hezekiah is, he starts off, Hezekiah started his job as king of Judah when he was 25. So he was a young guy, just starting out. Four years after he, Four years after he started out, when he was only 29, Samaria is besieged by Assyria for three years and fell to Assyria. So this is the northern kingdom of Israel. So you had the, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And now the northern kingdom basically gets besieged for three years and falls to Assyria. So this is the end of the northern kingdom of Israel, just after Hezekiah's reign started. Hezekiah is barely 30 years old when Judah becomes the lone Hebrew kingdom left. Hezekiah gets a repeat for a few years. And when he's 39, Assyria comes back and starts knocking on Judah's door. One by one, Hezekiah watches the noose tighten at the fortified cities of Judah fall, including Lachish, the treasure city. So basically, he's now alone and broke. Assyria just took his bank account. To make matters worse, Hezekiah decides to pay off the Assyrian king to get him to go away. And he strips off the gold and takes all the silver from the temple that he just restored to the temple 
just to pay the ransom to Assyria to buy some time. So Hezekiah is alone, he's broke, and he's humiliated. And like any bully, once they've hit you up once and they've gotten away with it, they're going to come back. Syria essentially comes back to Judah to attempt a mugging on the nation state level. To give some perspective, let's look at a map. Now, this is the Assyrian Empire at this point, and it's huge. And if you look, way down there, that little speck, it's Jerusalem. That is all Hezekiah had, all the rest of it. So Hezekiah was literally the last holdout in the middle of enemy territory. He's broke, and he's basically just there all by himself in his little bitty town. And the Syrian representatives stood outside the city with this huge army and started mocking Hezekiah and even God. Now, in our day and time, we are in an uncomfortable situation with all that's going on in the world today. But the residents of Judah were being threatened to the point of being, they were threatened to being starved to the point where their own poop would look like an entree, according to 2 Kings 18.27. Now, we haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> That's, that's pretty bad. Hezekiah had a whole lot of fear, a tremendous amount. The odds were not in his favor, and he had no place to turn. He was a man pushed to the very brink. He was a caged animal with literally someone poking the cage. So what did he do? Well, if you remember the thing from the day, I bet you can guess. He had fear of all that was going on around him, and that is true. But he had a greater fear that drove him to do the right thing. He feared the Lord God more than all the things that were going on in this world and flung himself on God's mercy. And as we know, God does not disappoint. God sent an angel to decimate the army of the Syrians during the night and send what few are left of the Syrians running back home afraid of the God of Judah. If Hezekiah had folded, if he had let the fears of this world get to him too much, and if he forgot the Lord Almighty, Judah's story would have ended right there, shortly after the northern kingdom's fall. In this life, we will face many things to be afraid of. Right now, we have way more than the usual. Some of us may feel like caged animals because it's been so long since we actually left our houses. Some may be feeling the pressure of not knowing how to pay for groceries. Some of us may be afraid of what will happen to society and if we'll ever get things right to make things more equal and just. Some of us may be afraid of this, what this election will hold and if our nation will hold together. There are many, many things to be afraid of out there. However, as Christians, we know the secret. No matter how big, how insurmountable, how much that we cannot see a way through things, and how much we have to fear in this world, remember the word of God to the Hebrew people in Exodus 20.20. 20. And Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be for you, so that you may not sin. And these words were spoken very early in the Bible, and they still hold true today. Remember to fear God above all else. There are big issues out there, but God is so very much bigger, and he is really what matters. Remember that God holds all things in his hands. And that includes you and me. Like Hezekiah, when it seems to be too much, take it all to God. Put it in his hands, along with your life, and God will not disappoint. Now there is more to go into, and our fear of God is the beginning of knowledge, because the Bible truly is truly beautiful. And there are many layers to God's word. But for time's sake and breath, Lord Hezekiah for us, if we remember to fear God above all else and keep his commandments, we will make our way to this world in his hands. And that seems like a very smart idea to me. Psalm 34, 8 through 16, we read a beautifully stated, this is beautifully stated. In Psalm 34, beginning in verse 8, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. O fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life 
and loves many days, that he may see good. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord against those who do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. We have a choice in this life. We can take the fears of this world, and we can let them beat on us, or we can fear what really counts. Fears of this world will lead to anxieties, nervous problems, all sorts of issues that are not, not good for us. If you follow the fears of this world, all you get is pretty much to smell like pee. But if you fear God, fear God is kind of like the athlete, the performer that gets a bit nervous before they go compete on, compete or go on stage. It's there. It drives us, but it drives us to be better. When we put God before all else, we are driven to be better, love deeper, and live more fulfilling than more fulfilling life than any that could be without him. It is the fear that makes us better. And so, if you ever find yourself like Adam and Eve, and you know that you aren't ready for God's inspection, the gift of salvation is always available. Even though we are apart, water can still be found. Bathtubs work. We proved that with the baptism of Ava last week. If you are ready to put God first and want to be baptized, or if there's anything else that you want to bring to the congregation for prayers, please let us know as we sing the invitation song.